الجبال من أنزل الأمطار فجر الأنهار وأنبت الأزهار تزقرف الجبال ذاك العاد في علا من أبدع الكون سوى سبحان الله وبحمد الله ولا إله إلا الله ذاك العاد في علا من أبدع الكون سوى سبحان الله وبحمد الله ولا إله إلا الله من علم العصفور في الجو أن يطير ومن جل الغدير ودفاق الشلال من علم العصفور في الجو أن يطير ومن جل الغدير ودفاق الشلال ذاك العالم في علا من أبدع الكون سوى سبحان الله وبحمد الله ولا إله إلا الله ذاك العالم في علا من أبدع الكون سوى سبحان الله وبحمد الله لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئة أعمالنا ما يحده الله فلا مدل له وما يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم والشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار We begin, we begin by praising Allah and we praise him and we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness we seek refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none to misguide. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship. And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is Abdullah, he is the worshipper of Allah, the servant of Allah, the slave of Allah. And he is Rasulullah, he is the Messenger of Allah. After that, the best speech is the Book of Allah, and the best way is the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the worst of all the affairs are those matters that have been newly introduced into the religion. And every matter that is newly introduced into the religion of Islam is a bid'ah, an innovation. And all of the innovations are misguidance. All misguidance is going astray, and all going astray is in the fire. Brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon you. Today, we want to talk about an important question. A question that is on the tongues and in the minds of many people. It is a claim that is made against our religion, the religion of Islam. An accusation, in fact, a slander against our religion. That our religion oppresses women. And I intend here today, I hope to demonstrate, not only that this is a lie and a slander, but actually we will see who are the people, and which is the nation, and which is the ideology that is in fact really responsible for oppressing women. And sometimes when you get into a discussion with people, it's very important to define your terms. Define your terms. Try and understand what is it exactly you are talking about. When you say Islam oppresses women, we want to understand what these terms mean. Now hopefully, most of us understand what the term women means. We hope, anyway. Okay, but the term we want to talk about today is the term oppression. What does oppression mean? And I'm going to spend a little bit of time defining and looking into the concept of oppression. What does it mean? What is its reality? And this is very important. So let's define this term oppression. First of all, there's no doubt that oppression is something that everybody hates and despises. Nobody likes oppression. The use of the word oppression is a type 
of an offensive derogatory term. We know that the Prophet ﷺ said that dhulam, the oppression, will stand as darkness on the day of judgment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in the Quran that He does not love the zalimun, the oppressors. And so it is very clear that Islam itself and the Quran itself condemns oppression. And in fact, our noble religion orders us, and it is one of our duties and obligations, to fight against oppression. And that is one of the very reasons why we are called to jihad, to relieve people from tyranny and from oppression. So oppression is not something that Islam tolerates. Oppression is something that this noble religion condemns. It is something, of course, that all human beings hate. So let us therefore define actually what we mean by oppression. Implicit in the meaning of the word oppression is the concept of denying something its rights. Now we're very used to hearing a lot about rights, especially so-called human rights. We hear often about people's human rights being violated. We also have animal rights. And different sections of society have different rights. So, we, in order to understand what oppression is, we have to make a further understanding. What is rights? What is the right of something? What does that mean when we talk about human rights or this is the right of something? Okay. The right of something means it implies that it is something that is natural to it. So the right of something implies, and that is understood in its meaning, that it is something that is part of its nature. It is natural to it. Let's give an example. Now, has anyone seen the, f- the film Free Willy? Okay, it make you cry. Didn't it make you cry, that film? Made me cry. Okay, so if you haven't seen it, Free Willy is about this great big killer whale. And this great big beautiful killer whale is locked up in a small little compound for people's entertainment. Now of course, I don't know if any of you went and have ever been to see one of these killer whales or some of these dolphins put on display in these small little pens where they jump and they go through hoops and so on and so forth. And of course, as little children, we go and we watch it and it's all very amusing. Isn't that fantastic? But a lot of people must go away thinking about how an animal, such a beautiful animal, could be confined to such a narrow space. An animal that was created whose natural environment is to swim in thousands of miles of ocean. And so without doubt, most people would recognize that this is a type of oppression. That this animal is oppressed. Because why? It has been taken away from its natural environment. It's taken away from what is naturally due to it to be free. So, this is oppression. Another example of oppression that is, I'm sure, very easy for all of us to understand. It is the right of a worker. If you work for somebody and you are employed by somebody, implicit in the nature of being a worker is that you get paid for your work. If someone does not pay you for your work, then without doubt we would all agree that this is oppression. That we have been deprived of our rights. I worked, my right is to be paid. If someone deprives me, I have been oppressed. Okay, so I hope therefore that we have understood oppression. Oppression means to deprive something of its rights. Which means to deprive something of what its, what its nature requires of it. So therefore, let's go back to our discussion. The point at hand. Does Islam oppress 
women. Does Islam oppress women? Therefore, we ask the question again, with our definitions, does Islam deny women their rights? Does Islam deprive women of what is natural to them? Does it take them away from their nature? And does it deprive them of what naturally they should have? This is the question. And of course, to answer that question, we also have to answer before that another question. What is the nature of women? What is their nature? We can only really talk about whether something or someone oppresses women or not when we understand what is the nature of women. Does Islam deprive women of their nature? Does Islam take away from them rights that are naturally due to them? Due to their nature? This is the question. And then we will see, certainly, without a doubt, that there is no way that Islam oppresses women. Because Islam is the religion that recognizes, in fact, the true nature of women. Because it is from the one who created women. It is from the one who created the universe. Islam is from Allah. It is from God. It is from the Creator. And He knows us better than we know ourselves. He is closer to us in His knowledge than our jugular vein. He is intimate in His knowledge with every single detail of our existence. Allah, He is al Latif. He is the one who is aware of every single subtlety. And Islam has been revealed by Allah. And Allah is the one who is most acquainted with the nature of the woman and the nature of the man. And so what we find in the religion of Islam is that Islam has set a paradigm, Islam has set an example, Islam has given us and defined for us the roles of men and the roles of women according to our natures, not according to some ideology, not according to some hopeful or wishful thinking that wouldn't it be nice if this and wouldn't it be nice with that. But this is not actually connected in any way with the reality of how people are. And what we're going to find, indeed, is that the Western world has been experimenting with human beings on a massive scale for the past 60 years. Humanity has been going through a massive experiment. And I'm sure we are all familiar with the ideology prevalent in the West. The ideology that tells us, not that men and women are different, but that men and women are the same. There is no difference between the man and the woman. And as they claim, our differences are a product of conditioning. Our differences are a product of conditioning. This is the old debate between nature and nurture. Nature and nurture. What is your nature and what have you been nurtured? What have you been grown up with? How much of our mentality, how much of our behavior is a product of our nature and how much is a product of our environment and our upbringing? And of course, as you know, the Western ideological system, and not only the Western, I mean whether, of course, communism is not really existing anymore except perhaps in China, but it has been a prevalent ideology in the West, and then by necessity, not only in the West, but this has been hoisted upon the rest of humanity, 
Because without doubt, as we know, the West controls the mass media. The West has the most influential say in the ideologies that are prevalent in the world. So this is their ideology. Men and women are the same. And the reason, as they have been claiming, that boys like to play with guns and cars and they like mechanical things is because that's the way we've been brought up. Our parents indoctrinate us. Boys wear blue, boys play with cars, boys like guns. And girls, they wear pink, and they play with dolls, you know, and they like makeup and earrings and stuff like that, because they've been conditioned to be like that. So this is what they have been saying. In fact, there's no reason why girls shouldn't play with guns and, and cars and wear blue, and there's no reason why boys shouldn't wear earrings. <laughs> well, I mean, so these days... Uh, they shouldn't wear earrings and wear pink, okay, and play with dolls. There's no reason. Now, interestingly enough, believe it or not, in Israel, or we should call it occupied Palestine, they have been conducting for many years now, for the past 40 years, there has been a famous kibbutz experiment, an experiment on a kibbutz. Now, in this kibbutz, what they did is they separated as much as possible from the earliest possible age. They separated children from their parents. And the reason they did that is because they did not want their parents to influence the children in their habits and their behavior. In other words, what they were attempting to do was to eliminate the nurture side. Eliminate nurture and let their nature come forward. And what they thought and what they believed, and this was their ideology, is that children would not care what toys they played with. And this is what they did. They left these children in dormitories. On their own as much as possible. And in the dormitories they put toy guns, toy cars, Meccano sets, dolls, makeup, jewelry, so on and so forth. And they thought that what would be proven from this experiment that went on for 40 years is that they, would, they wouldn't care. The boys would be as, just as happy playing with dolls as the girls. And the girls would be just as happy as playing with cars and, and, and guns as the boys. But what did they actually discover after 40 years of experimentation? Consistently, time after time after time, the boys would take the toys that were guns and cars and mechanical things. And the girls would take the dolls and take the makeup and, all the, and the jewelry. This is what they discovered. 40 years they did this experiment. And in fact, they've been experimenting with humanity. They've been experimenting with society on a massive scale. They have been trying to indoctrinate us for years and years under the guise of what they call feminism, the same ideology. And what they have discovered now, scientifically, they have proven that boys and girls are different. From the very earliest age, and they have done controlled scientific experiments that have been reviewed by peer groups and confirmed again and again that boys look at certain things and certain toys and they concentrate them from birth. From, as, from the moment they can start seeing, they concentrate on certain things that are of a mechanical nature. And girls... They concentrate on things that are what they call the girly things. And so there's no possibility for these babies to be subjected to some type of brainwashing by society. In other words, it's biological. It's inbuilt into us. It's our nature. Men and women are different. That is the fact. It's in our biology. It's in our very makeup. Now, let us read something that has been mentioned by a French Nobel laureate. His name is Alex Camel. And this is what he said. 
The difference between men and women are of more fundamental nature than is usually realized. And that these differences are caused by the very structure of the tissue and by the impregnation of the entire organism with specific chemical substances secreted by the ovary. Ignorance of these fundamental facts has led promoters of feminism to believe that both sexes should have the same responsibilities. In reality, women differs profoundly from man. Every one of the cells of her body bears the mark of her sex. The same is true of her organs and above all of her nervous system. Women should develop their aptitudes without imitating the males. This is what this French scientist said. But of course, that is not what we are taught even today. And of course, this exposes the lie of the claim of the Western world to be motivated by science. Because we do not find them promoting this ideology that has now been proven by science. Rather, they still continue to promote the misguided notion that men and women are the same. That both men and women should be able to work. That both men and women should be able to do the same things and should be encouraged to. And they claim this under the banner of noble ideals. But the facts are, brothers and sisters, rather more mundane than that. We imagine that something that we have, I have uh, noticed in The Economist, it's the famous magazine in, in England, an economist, an article in The Economist called The Liberation of Women in the West, one of the most enduring revolutions of the 20th century, produced by Western Europe. This is what they've claimed about it. But in fact, when we examine the reality of it, the reasons for their pr promoting this feminism, as I said, is much more mundane. It's actually mostly to do with economics. They theorize that if you have half the population of your country staying at home, not being employed, then what you have done is you have not utilized half the economic potential of your society. In other words, if the only ones who are working are men, then men are the ones who work, men are the ones who control the money, and men are the ones who essentially will spend the money. If we get the women working, that means we will have more disposable income, more people buying, more people spending, and our economy will increase. This is what they imagined. This is what they imagined. And it seems to make some sort of sense, doesn't it? If we look at the origins of this, it started in the First World War. In the First World War, when lots of men were going out and getting slaughtered in their millions, in the battlefields in France, and also in the Second World War, the women were forced to go to the factories to produce munitions. And then they got a taste of liberation. And once they got a taste of liberation, as they called it, and they started having their own incomes. They didn't want to go back to the old ways of being chained to the kitchen sink, as they called it. And it seemed that for a time it was working. Wealth increased, expenditure increased, the economy went forward. But now, amazingly, economists have come across a new reality that they've only just woken up to quite recently. This is quite interesting. They've realized that once a certain percentage of your population reaches over 65, and in fact it's around 30%, so if 30% of your population is over 65 years old, what they discovered 
is the economy of your country becomes not viable anymore. In, in other words, the economy won't work. Why? Because the money you need to spend to care for the over 65s is more than the money that those people who are earning and working can generate. And it's nothing to do with they care about old people, now they want to introduce new laws to let people work till they're 75. It's nothing to do with their caring about old people. They've started to realize that they're getting an increasing aging population and they're not going to be able to sustain the economy. And now having told women that you should leave the home, liberate yourself from your husband, liberate yourself from that kitchen sink, what do you want to have kids for anyway? Waste your time with that. Go out and earn some money. Now they're trying to get them to get back in the home, back to the kitchen sink and having babies again. Because there's not enough young people in society. And of course, what is this proving is the complete nonsense of those people who try to live their lives according to the feeble opinions and ideologies imagined in the minds of human beings. And when they abandon the perfect guidance of Allah, they will only end up destroying themselves. In fact, what we find is that Western society is the society that oppresses women. Because the nature of the woman is to be a mother. The nature of the woman is to be caring for children. The nature of the woman, her whole biology, her whole chemistry, her nervous system, her mental system is all constructed. Whether you believe in Allah or you believe in evolution, it's not something you can argue about. Either Allah has created women like that, or evolution over millions of years has made women like that. To be the ones that bear the children, that carry them, that give birth to them, that that feed them, that, that, that care for them, that nurture them. And believe me, the one who is most capable of doing it is the woman. The man can have a go, and maybe he has to do that sometimes. But the reality is, as every single one of us who have got kids here, we know the reality. We know the reality of who can really look after the women, uh, look after the children. We know that. And us men know it's not us. We could do it for a day, or maybe half a day, and if we do it for a day, then we say, Phew, now I know what my wife has to put up with every day, and I don't know how she does it. You know, that's the reality. Because that's the way Allah made us. So what do we find? We find as usual, and it's not surprising, we shouldn't go, oh that's amazing, because you know what, it's not really that amazing. If we are believers in Allah, and we believe in Islam, and we believe Islam is from Allah, we would expect that what Allah teaches us is to be in agreement with what has been scientifically proven. And of course, the Qur'an confirms this reality. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the wife of Imran who dedicated her child, who is of course Maryam, to the the temple, to 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 be a priest in the temple. But of course, when she gave birth to Maryam, she said, I have given birth to a female child. And Allah knows very well what she had given birth to. The male is not like the female. The male is not like the female. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. Brothers and sisters, dear guests, the male is not like the female. Science tells us, reason tells us, experience tells us, and Allah reminds us. Men and women are different. So it is the society that oppresses women is a society that takes women away from their nature. A society that tells women that being a mother, that being uh, the housekeeper, that the one who is doing perhaps one of the most essential jobs in society is a degrading position. They talk about it. She's chained to the kitchen sink. Like she's some slave, like it's some menial task. 
And rather the woman who is honoured is what? The actress, the model, the super businesswoman. And the more clothes she takes off, the more honoured she is. This is the woman they honour in this society. The career woman, the politician, the woman who's a doctor, the woman who's this and who's that. Look at her, how successful she is, how independent she is. And anyone who stays at home, looking after the children, oh, look at that poor little thing. Look at her. Oh, yes, you know what I'm talking about. This is a society that oppresses women. And you know what? You see it everywhere. You see miserable women. Women who've reached 35 years old and they're desperate to have kids. Suddenly it hits them. Suddenly their nature overtakes them. And now what do we find? In order to overcome this, science comes in. They've introduced this intro, intro viral, I can't remember what it's, uh, intro viral fertilization and women are being fertilized when they don't even, they're not even capable of producing eggs anymore. But they get fertilized and they're having children at 40, at 50 because they missed out because of the pressure society put on them. This is oppressing women. This is taking women away from her nature. This is her making her feel inadequate if she is a mother and if she is a wife and she is a homekeeper, she is made to feel inferior. That is oppression. It is a society that treats women as a commodity. As a commodity. That is a society that oppresses and denigrates women. It is an evil and unjust and tyrannical society. Do not be confused, my brothers and sisters, in Islam. Do not be confused. Do not be taken in by their propaganda. Do not be influenced by their lies. And believe me, they have sown the seeds of their own destruction. They have sown the seeds of their own destruction. And you see it. Because who is looking after the kids? Who gives the kids the love and the care and the attention that they need? Who is there to teach the kids the morality, right from wrong, manners? You know who it is? MTV. PlayStation. Because mummy is out working along with daddy. Huh? And who else is looking after the children? Who is looking after them? Can anyone look after a child like the mother? No. And so you find children coming with no morals, no concept of right and wrong, violence, sex, drugs, music, fantasy is the norm for them. That is the norm for them. And love, they haven't found love in the home. So what do they do? They join gangs. That's what they do. They join gangs. They look for it somewhere. If they can't find it in the home, they'll try to find somewhere to belong. It's happening in America. It happens in England. I'm sure it happens here in Australia. Kids on the street. Doing all sorts of things. Why? Because there was no one who nurtured them. They are sowing the seeds of their own destruction. They have already done it. And now they are reaping the evil rewards of their evil philosophy and their injustice and their tyranny. And they blame us. And they point the finger at us. They point the finger at Islam. They are the guilty ones. They are the oppressors. They are the tyrants. They are one, the ones who have degraded women and taken them from their nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them for. In which they should feel pride. Look what Islam teaches my brothers and sisters. Look at the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look to the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The woman, woman is honored in Islam. The woman is honored, revered in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us, reverence Allah and the wombs that bore you. Reverence Allah and the wombs that bore you. And the name of Allah ar-Rahman. And the word Raham for womb, it's from the same root 
and whoever cuts off from the womb, then Allah will cut off from them, as the Prophet ﷺ said. It is one of the greatest sins in Islam to disobey your parents, especially your mother. Especially your mother. Al-Araf. What is Al-Araf? Al-Araf. As Abdullah ibn Abbas he said, Al-Araf is the heights. It is a place, some mountains between the hellfire and paradise. And who is on Al-Araf? Abdullah ibn Abbas he described it. Some mountains with some rivers and some lakes. And on this place and on these mountains are people who fought jihad in the path of Allah and were killed martyrs. But they went and fought that jihad against their parents' wishes. So the good of their fighting jihad is equaled by the evil of their disobeying their parents. Subhanallah. When a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when a man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, who has the most right to my kindness? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Your mother. And after that, Messenger of Allah, your mother. And after that, Messenger of Allah, your mother. And after that, Messenger of Allah, then your father. Your mother, your mother, your mother. Paradise lies at the feet of your mother. May your face be rubbed in the dust. May you be humiliated, a person whose parents reach old age and they do not enter paradise by failing to serve them. They do not enter paradise because they failed to serve their old parents. May you be humiliated, the person who reaches that time. Allah has accorded such honor to the parents, but particularly to the mother. Particularly to the mother. She is the one who bore you for nine months in pain and suffering. She gave birth to you and cared for you. You could never, ever ever pay your mother back. Ever. There is nothing you can do to pay your mother back. This is what our deen Islam teaches. To respect the woman. You can never pay her back. If your father, if you found your father a slave, you bought him and set him free, you'd pay him back. But your mother, there's nothing you can do. A man came with his mother on his back to Umar ibn al-Khattab. Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, I have taken my mother on my back through the whole of the Hajj. The whole of the Hajj. Did I pay her back? Umar, he replied, Young man, you didn't pay her back for one tear she shed when she gave birth to you. And Islam oppresses women? No. Islam honors women for what Allah has created her for, for her nature. It honors her. For what is her nature? And that is giving someone their rights. That is giving someone their rights. And that is why Allah made men the maintainers and protectors of women. They are the glass vessels. The best of you are the ones who are best to their wives. The best of you are the ones who are best to their wives. This is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught. How far unfortunately many Muslims are from the commands of Allah, from the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is no doubt that there are many Muslims who are abusive and tyrannical and who do oppress their women. But that's not Islam. Islam is not responsible for that any more than Islam is responsible for a Muslim who drinks alcohol or takes drugs or kills innocent human beings. Islam is free from that. Islam teaches us to honor women, to respect them, but for their nature. The best of you are those who are best to their wives. And of course the Prophet ﷺ was the one who is best to their wives. And Allah has made men the maintainers and protectors of women. They are the glass vessels. They are delicate. They are sensitive. They need to be treated with care and with love and with patience. Allah has given them a certain nature. 
a certain nature, they need that nature in order to be able to look after the children. You could never do it, brothers. Never. But that nature means that there is something about them. They have certain emotions. They have certain emotional responses that they need those responses to deal with the important task of raising the children. And that means you have to deal with them, brothers, in a certain way. You have to be patient with them. There are certain things that happen to them at a certain time of the month, and it means that sometimes they behave in quite a crazy way. And, but they need that. That's the way Allah created them. Those chemicals are there for a reason. It happens for a reason. And we should honor that. This is Allah's creation. Perfect creation. Perfect at doing what Allah intended it to do. And we have to respect that. They are glass vessels. Treat them with kindness. Treat them with softness. Leave them the way they are. Yes, the Prophet ﷺ said, Woman is created from the bent, from the rib. And the most bent part of the rib is the topmost part. The mind, the mentality. So enjoy women the way they are. The Prophet told us, enjoy them. Enjoy them the way they are. With this bentness, this, this, this way that they are. But enjoy them. Because if you try to straighten them, you'll never be able to do it. And the straightening of it, in fact, will be divorce. You are trying to change Allah's nature that He created. Don't do it. Enjoy them the way they are. It is part of their beautiful quality that makes the women the, 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 the thing that we love. And especially the righteous women. About whom the Prophet ﷺ said, The whole world is green and verdant. But the most precious thing in this dunya, and subhanallah, wallahi, that is the truth. The Prophet always spoke the truth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The most precious thing in this dunya is a righteous woman. There is nothing better and nothing more precious in this world than a righteous woman. And whoever marries a righteous woman, inshallah will succeed. Whoever marries a woman for just her beauty, or just her wealth, or her lineage... What will you get? Believe me, misery. Marry the righteous one. Marry the pious one. Marry the religious one and be successful. This is the nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. This is the path to a beautiful and successful society. It is the foundation of it. Islam recognizes it. Confucianism recognized it also. In fact, every sensible society knows that the very foundation of society is the family. And at the heart of every family is the woman who teaches and cares and nurtures for the children. So we honor her. Islam teaches us to honor her, to respect her as our mother, to revere her. And they say that Islam does not give women their rights. And they say that Islam oppresses women. You know there's a saying that we should give back to them. A saying that from their own books that they say they believe in. A beautiful saying attributed to Jesus. You know what it is? It says, take the log out of your eye before you try and take a twig out of somebody else's. You've got a great big log in your eye and you're trying to take a twig out of someone else's eye? Huh? That's what they're doing. They see a twig in our eye and they've got a great big log in theirs. They're so busy criticizing us. But if we compare the two, surely they are people on complete, almost complete misguidance in that regard. So my dear brothers and sisters and dear listeners, when we really examine Islam, when we study the Qur'an, when we study the example of our noble messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we will truly see that Islam is the religion that accords the women their rights. Men are there to maintain and protect women. It is the job of the man, our job, to make sure that the woman can stay at home 
and she can look after the house and look after the kids and feel comfortable there and feel happy there. That's our job. To maintain them and to protect them. That's our responsibility. Because that is a weighty responsibility, Allah has also required something from the women in respect to the man. And that is that God made him, because Allah made the man, the maintainer and the protector, Allah gave him that responsibility. Allah didn't ask the women to go out there and earn the money, confront all that evil in there in society. Allah didn't ask the women to do that. Rather, He asked the women to care and educate and bring up the children with that love and that morality and that goodness that they need. The man, however, he has to, and he's responsible for your guidance in the deen, in the religion. He's responsible to make sure, although quite often it might be the other way around, the women often, alhamdulillah, and that's the righteous women, make sure the men are on the straight path. But it is our responsibility and because of that Allah requires that the woman is obedient to her husband. That when he tells her to do something and he commands her, she should do her best if it's within her capability. If, this is important, if it's in her capability, she should do it. And this is the respect. This is important in our society. The wife respects the husband and insha'Allah the children will respect the mother. And if the children respect the mother and the wife respects the husband and the husband respects the authority of the emir, of the ruler, this is our religion. This is the basis of a true stable society. But what you find is when the husband, when the wife doesn't respect her husband, the children will not respect her. And when the man does not respect the woman and treat her with justice and with the gentleness and with the kindness that Islam has ordered, Allah will put over him a tyrannical ruler to oppress and make his life difficult as he oppressed and made his wife's life difficult. And I believe this. I believe truly. If you look at the, if you look at the Muslim world today, you will see. You will see. The way the ruler treats the people reflects the way the man treats his wife. You will find it. The way the ruler treats the people will be the way the man treats his wife. If he oppresses her, Allah will make a ruler to oppress him. So brothers and sisters, we know that our beautiful deen is based on taqwa, the fear of Allah, the consciousness of Allah, observing the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is where we have to start with our family, rectifying ourselves. Brothers and sisters, my final appeal to you, please, is remove from yourself this jahiliyyah, this jahiliyyah, this ignorance, That is the ideology and the perverted and sick ideology that has been propagated by Western civilization. Brothers and sisters, I ask you to remove that from yourselves. I find it so sad when I hear brothers and sisters talking about, well, I've had two kids, I think that's enough. Because we know you've been conquered already. They don't need to come and invade our lands. We've, they've already defeated us ideologically. Our minds have already been taken over. We've already begun to think like them. We push our daughters to get degrees, to become doctors, to become, uh, to become engineers, to become nuclear physicists. Look at my daughter. I'm so proud of her, what she's achieved. What? She's had ten kids and brought them up in Islam. That would be something proud that you taught your daughter to be like that. No, she became a doctor. That's what we're proud of these days. That is sick, brothers and sisters. That is sick. And that is that is not what our religion teaches. And I'm not saying, I am not saying, please do not misunderstand me in its importance. Yes, we need Muslim women doctors. We need women to be educated, to educate our children. 
We need women to be educated to open Muslim schools so that they can educate our children in Islam, in the deen and in the dunya. But we have to understand, we must not get confused. We must not get confused and imagine that this is what is going to make us successful. Don't be mentally defeated. Don't allow yourselves to think with this false ideology. No, brothers and sisters. Think like Muslims. Think with Islam. Think with the Quran. Think with the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And you will see, brothers and sisters, we bring up a generation who are like that. You will see. You will see the success that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring once again to this ummah. And you will see that once again, brothers and sisters, that when our foundations are strong, alhamdulillah, Allah will give us the success of this life and of the life to come. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.